For the next 31 Mondays, we are going to be nerding out so hard on building science, harder than we've ever done before. Before we get there, we want to tell you three things. First of all, this is the biggest indoor air quality study ever. So you will be seeing and hearing new information. Secondly, this information and these people, these scientists, they have changed our lives and frankly, changed the trajectory of our career. Thirdly, this information is so highly technical because you're going to be hearing from the world-class scientists talking to each other that I am going to be acting as commentator after this first introductory overview session that we're about to show you. So you'll see me every Monday. We're going to call them Mastermind Mondays. We'll put out one session a week. Um, and so feel free to engage in this conversation. This is going to be like a huge story told over 31 weeks that's going to be like something that we've never done this channel before. Yeah. So here we go. Well, good morning, everybody. It is um, really an honor to be here and uh, share with you this beginning of our celebration of um, an amazing program, the Chemistry of Indoor Environments, uh, organized and sponsored by the Sloan Foundation. Charlie and I are going to be playing tag team. Uh, he'll do the meaty part in the middle, and I will provide the fantastic beginning and a really great end. So um, we wanted to start with uh, trying to define indoor chemistry, uh, the program that we've been working on. And chemistry is an interesting subject because we all kind of know what it is, but the boundaries are rather fuzzy. So being able to provide a, a, a definition that is inclusive and has sharp boundaries is actually a challenge. This is a, you know, not a perfect definition, but uh, we say that indoor chemistry uh, concerns the processes that govern the chemical composition of air in buildings, specifically chemical transformations that occur in air, both in the gas phase and particle phase, and on surfaces and the associated transport and partitioning phenomena. And I challenge you to come up with a better definition. I'm sure it's possible. Well, indoor chemistry draws rather heavily on a close cousin, uh, atmospheric chemistry or outdoor chemistry, and uh, yet it's not the same. Uh, the, at a molecular level, the processes are fundamentally the same, but the things that control the processes and make something important in one environment versus another environment are quite different in many dimensions between indoor spaces and outdoor spaces. So we list here six important differences, some of which have order of magnitude scale difference between how they present in outdoor air and how they present indoors. For example, the surface to volume ratio, the fixed surface that is in contact with the atmosphere is uh, well below a meter square per cubic meter, whereas in indoor environments, it's a few uh, square meters per cubic meter. Uh, residence times outdoors might be uh, a day or a week, depending on an urban time scale or a regional time scale. Indoors, we're talking typically about an hour. These have important consequences for what matters, what controls, what dominates in these different spaces. The, um, we've heard and we know that about a decade ago, the um, uh, Chemistry of Indoor Environments program was launched. Uh, the first publications from this program appeared in 2015. One of the exercises Charlie and I undertook was to compile a bibliography of papers that have um, CIE sponsorship or that discuss the CIE program. Well, we have 240 in the list. I'm happy to share it with anybody on request. Um, you also know that Paula was the founding director and uh, Evan has taken over from her for the past couple of years. And I've plotted at the bottom uh, just a couple of displays of the scale of um, these publications, which are really an, an impressive achievement of this program and of all of you who've worked in it. Uh, up to a paper per week at the peak uh, was coming out and... Um, these papers have appeared in prominent journals, uh, especially journals in our field like ES&T and Indoor Air, but also papers in science and in PNAS in not small numbers. Uh, the research achievements that we want to summarize for you in this retrospective are organized along these five lines. And these lines follow the white paper that Paula and her uh, leadership team put together in the establishment of this program initially. So we'll begin talking by indoor 
uh, about indoor chemical sources and processes, uh, then move to indoor surfaces, talk about oxidants and photochemistry, uh, building design op operation and occupancy, and uh, finally a cross-cutting theme, which um, Paula has emphasized throughout, and that's the importance of uh, modeling. These, uh, of course, with 240 papers and 30 minutes, we are only presenting the tip of a much bigger iceberg. So I'll, I'll present a bit about theme one, and then Charlie will talk about team, themes two through five. Uh, theme one, indoor chemical sources and processes. I want to focus on one particular aspect of this story, which is volatile organic compounds. Uh, it, it was not unknown completely, but it was it has been way better demonstrated through the CIE program that indoor environments have a distinctive character of having rather high, surprisingly high concentrations of numerous volatile organic compounds, um, which help to shape or govern or define the nature of that interior space. Uh, the um, first deployment of a state-of-the-art tool um, developed for outdoor atmospheric chemistry, proton transfer reaction time of light mass spectrometry was applied uh, to um, an observational campaign in the house that we designated as H1 by uh, Alan Goldstein, with whom uh, I collab have collaborated for many years. And the result of our 13 weeks of monitoring under observe but do not disturb are displayed here. Um, six different locations in a single residence monitored on a once per 30 minute cycle, plotted here for eight weeks of summer and five weeks of the winter and uh, summed over all the VOCs that we measured, a few hundred uh, compounds. Among the things that we learned from these data are that the source of the VOCs was from the occupied space itself, that even when the house was vacant, the levels were elevated in the occupied space, indicating continuous emissions from the building materials and furnishings. And then when people are present, there are spikes that occur episodically, resulting from what we've learned is largely cooking uh, related emissions. We also know we, from an, a little bit earlier study using the same instrument in an occupied classroom that under high occupancy light furnishing conditions, the occupants themselves are major sources of the organic composition of the indoor air. One of the absolutely striking features of that study was that the number one most heavily emitted compound from university students, engineering students no less, uh, at the University of California at Berkeley during class was D5, a cyclic siloxane that is associated with antiperspirants and some other personal care products. Higher emissions of that compound than of anything else coming from these students. A follow-up study of this nature undertaken under the iCheer program produced these data among others, and they looked, they were able under controlled conditions to isolate the emissions that occurred from the skin surface from those that occurred from breath and what the emissions profile looked like when uh, these chemicals were exposed or these materials were exposed to ozone or not exposed to ozone. And what I wanna highlight here is that breath and skin emissions are comparable in scale and that the ozone um, influence was striking when skin is the emitter, but not so much when the VOCs are coming from breath. And so now I'll turn the podium to Charlie for the middle of this talk. Thank you, Bill. And it's certainly my pleasure to be here today. Theme two, processes on indoor surfaces. The uh, figure on the left displays these processes from a chemical perspective. The figure on the right displays the processes from a physical perspective. We've learned in the Sloan program that indoor surfaces are very large chemical reservoirs. The results shown in this figure come from experiments conducted at the UT test house during home chem. In these experiments, gas surface partitioning was examined for 19 volatile chemicals. In these experiments, from about seven in the morning to around 10 in the evening, the windows at the UT test house 
were opened and closed, opened and closed, opened and closed. What you see for these four small acids is that when the windows are open, the concentrations go down. When the windows are closed, they come back up to roughly the level they were before the windows were opened. And you see this happening repeatedly. Good evidence for how large these chemical reservoirs are. And you see from how quickly the levels came back when the windows are closed, that the air surface partitioning is fast, faster than air exchange in this particular example. Now, this slide shows results for four small acids, but it's not just chemicals that dissociate on surfaces that show this behavior. Similar behavior was observed for compounds like isoprene, ethanol, and phenol. When we think about these surface reservoirs, we can classify them as relatively polar reservoirs, think of water, or nonpolar reservoirs, think of something like octanol. The figure shows partitioning among three indoor compartments, indoor air, a polar reservoir, and a weakly polar reservoir. We've learned that many small molecules that are considered volatile outdoors behave as semi-volatile compounds indoors. They're partitioning to these polar and nonpolar reservoirs to a very large extent. For many of these VOCs, the amount that's present in the surface reservoirs is higher than the amount that's in the air. Now, if we think about the polar reservoir, as the pH of the polar reservoir changes, the fraction of acidic and basic species in that polar reservoir changes. So for example, if the pH of the polar reservoir goes up, more of the acidic species partition in the surface as opposed to the air than was the case before the pH increased. We've learned that painted surfaces are an extremely important interface in, in indoor environments. Now, pause and think about it for a moment. Painted surfaces are abundant indoors. In residences, roughly 60 to 70% of surfaces are painted surfaces. We can roughly estimate partitioning between air and these paint films using the octanol air partition coefficient. This is useful just in terms of making crude predictions. This quote comes from Algram et al., a paper published in 2020. Paint can serve as a vast reservoir for VOCs and in indoor environments. On the right, you see a figure which illustrates the diffusion of paint, of, of organics that have partitioned to a paint film, the diffusion through the film itself to the underlying substrate. And what you see in that figure is that for a large fraction of the VOCs that partition to the paint in the first place, they actually make it all the way to the substrate. And that's important for us to know. That's telling us that the substrate itself can wind up serving as a reservoir, but with the time constant quite different from the time constant for the paint film itself. Theme three is indoor oxidants and photochemistry. Here we see results that were targeting ozone chemistry in an occupied house. This is H1, which Bill described a few moments ago. Let's focus first on the panel for ozone. In the case of ozone, the outdoor concentrations are the red line. And we compare those outdoor concentrations to two indoor rooms, the uh, bedroom and the kitchen. The bedroom is the green line, the kitchen is the orange line. You see, first of all, that the indoor concentrations are substantially smaller than the outdoor concentrations, reflecting chemistry that has occurred indoors. You also see that the concentrations in the bedroom and the kitchen track the outdoor concentrations. When outdoor goes up, indoors goes up. When outdoors goes down, indoors goes down but with a slight time lag. Now, I want to remind you that when ozone reacts with squalene, a constituent of skin oil, two of the products are 6-MHO, a primary product, and 4-OPA, a secondary product. If we look at the 
lower two panels, the panel headed 6-MHO and 4-OPA. If you look at the red line, you see the outdoor concentrations are very low. On the other hand, if you look at the green and orange line, you see that we can readily detect 6-MHO in these two indoor environments. Now, something very important that came out of this study is the fact that a lot of the ozone, ozone skin oil chemistry is occurring off body. This is not just ozone reacting with the exposed skin and the clothing of the occupants. This also reflects ozone reacting with skin oils that are present on the surfaces in H1. This is a consequence of our skin flakes with which we shed at a very fast rate. And just the fact that we touch surfaces and leave something like fingerprints behind. A few comments on soiling of indoor surfaces by skin oil. Skin oils are rich in double bonds. There's more double bonds per more, more yeah, mole of skin oil uh, than double bonds per mole of most other indoor surface contaminants. And the skin oils are relatively fresh. We, the occupants, are depositing in them, in those environments, uh, fresh compared to organic compounds that have come in from outdoors and subsequently soiled the surfaces. You know how diverse indoor environments are. I think it's interesting to consider, to appreciate the fact that soiling by skin oil adds some commonality to all these diverse indoor environments. Any indoor environment that's occupied, there'll be soiling of surfaces by skin oil. When ozone reacts with squalene, we get six distinct Kriege intermediates. And we've learned from the program that these Kriege intermediates react with carbonyls to give secondary ozonides. They react with water to give alpha hydroxy hydroperoxides. They react with carboxylic acids to give alkyl hydroperoxides. And we've learned that these products are thermally stable, but they react quickly with water. And when they do, they form carbonyls and hydrogen peroxide. So given that last bullet, it's not so surprising that the gas, the fraction of gas phase products increases as the indoor water vapor concentration increases. A word about photochemistry. The figure on the right shows the photon flux for three common indoor light sources. It also shows the absorption spectrum from 300 nanometers to 410 nanometers for four species that are photolytically important indoors. With that, I'll present examples from three different studies. Lou et al. observed that light-induced reactions with nitrogen dioxide sorbed to a grime window, this is window films now, that light-induced reactions with that nitrogen dioxide produces nitrous acid. Wong et al. found that bleach use releases molecular chlorine, and that molecular chlorine in turn can photolyze with near UV visible light to form atomic chlorine. Matil et al. reported that photolysis of hypochlorous acid and molecular chlorine, again, released from bleach, acted, quotes, as a source of hydroxyl radicals and chlorine radicals to the indoor environment. Alkyl peroxy radicals are important free radicals found in indoor air. They're formed by ozone reacting with alkenes. They're formed by hy uh, hydroxyl radicals abstracting a hydrogen atom from almost all of the organics found indoors. Alkyl peroxyl radicals can participate in what are referred to as odd oxidation reactions. And many of you are familiar with odd oxidation reactions. This occurs when the concentrations of HO2 and NO are low enough for the alkyl peroxyl radicals to rearrange through a H atom shift. These odd oxidation reactions produce highly oxidized molecules referred to as HOMs. 
These HOMs have large oxygen to carbon ratios and they're precursors for secondary organic aerosols. Quoting from an article by Demetrius Pagonis and colleagues from Paul Zeman's group, we measured the formation of HOMs resulting from the ozone initiated odd oxidation of limonene emitted inside the University of Colorado Art Museum. I like that idea that you could see odd oxidation in this art museum from ozone reacting with limonene. Theme four is building design operation and occupancy. The bar graph on this slide comes from work done by Barb Turpin's group. The uh, first author there was Sarah Duncan. And you see concentrations of water-soluble organic gases measured indoors and outdoors at for 13 homes in New Jersey and North Carolina. And what's striking is how much higher the indoor concentrations are than the outdoor concentrations, about a factor of 15. The major species contributing in these homes to, to this signal are acetic, lactic, and formic acid. They comprise about 40% of the measured water-soluble organic compounds. In a different study occurring in a Colorado classroom, this comes from Paul Zeman's group, concentrations of gaseous carboxylic acids were found to be about seven times larger indoors than outdoors. And then still another study from Alan Goldstein group, the content, and this occurred in a, in a home, H1 again, I believe, the concentration of acetic acid, formic acid, and methanol were found to comprise 70% of the continuous organic emissions in the home. What I find, again, very interesting is the fact that water on cooling coils is an important sink for these water-soluble organics. You think about it for a moment, and it makes sense. I mean, they are water-soluble, right? And we, this is an underappreciated sink prior to these observations. If that condensate is being drained from the building, this is a process that removes water-soluble organics from indoor air. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated efforts to develop indoor treatments to protect against disease transmissions. These include cleaning with bleach, disinfecting air with germicidal ultraviolet radiation, uh, other interventions, uh, adding hydrogen peroxide or ozone or free radicals or negative ions to the air. The quote comes from a review article by Doug Collins and Delphine Farmer. Prolific use of chemical disinfectants and reactive processes for air cleaning warns extreme caution. There can be unintended chemistry that occurs when some of these interventions are used. We've learned so much about cleaning with bleach and the chemistry that occurs when you clean with bleach. It releases hypochlorous acid, molecular chlorine, nitrile chloride, chlorine monoxide, these chlorinated amines. The bleach initi initiated chemistry produces chlorinated and nitrogenated VOCs. Hypochlorous acid reacts with carbon-carbon do bo double bonds as fast as ozone does. Hypochlorous acid chlorinates squalene through the chlorhydrin reaction. Hypochlorous acid reacts with all indoor surfaces, not just the surfaces originally treated with bleach, reflecting the redistribution through partitioning of the hypochlorous acid. I've already mentioned that photolysis of molecular chlorine generates chlorine atoms. The use of bleach also increases the indoor concentrations of hydroxyl radicals, chlorine radicals, ClO radicals. Hypochlorous acid can react with amino acids to give N-chlorodiamines. UV-222, UV emitted at uh, 222 nanometers, has received considerable attention since the pandemic as a way to control the virus. At this wavelength, it can kill SARS-CoV-2. What we've learned from publications that have come out just in the past couple of months that UV-222 also generates ozone indoors. In the figure shown here, you see for a 33 cubic meter office, when the UV-222 lamp is on, 
the ozone concentrations are roughly six times higher indoors than when the lamp is off. The plot on the right shows the decay of ozone, that's the red-black line, and the decay of carbon dioxide in these office experiments. And you see that the decay of ozone, the red line, is much faster than the decay of carbon dioxide. That's reflecting chemistry in this office. And that chemistry is producing products. And we don't know what the toxicity of those products are, most of them. So it's very important, we think, to be aware of the indoor chemistry that can occur indoors when we use an intervention such as UV-222. Modeling has been part of the Sloan program since the first white paper, the conceptualization of the program in, in 2012, that first draft. Modeling integrates the discovery of these different experiments, and it takes specific experiments and allows us to generalize from one environment to many environments. The Sloan program initiated the Modeling Consortium for Chemistry of Indoor Environments in 2017. Manabu Sharewa has served as the PI of that program. About a year later, it initiated the Surface Consortium for Chemistry of Indoor Environments, which includes a modeling component. And the PI of that program has been Vicky Gracian. Um, it's been very impressive to see the collaboration between experimentalists and modelers in both MOKI and SURF CIE. Um, it's also been impressive to see the collaboration between modelers who work on different time scales and spatial scales. Those scales are illustrated in this uh, figure on the right uh, from the MOKI program. Uh, at the very bottom left, you see molecular dynamics that occurs on spatial scales of nanometers and time scales of nanoseconds. And on the top right, you see computational fluid dynamics studies modeling, which occurs on spatial scales of meters and time scales of days. This slide is an example of that, the different spatial and temporal scales that have been modeled in the both MOKI and SURF CIE. On the left, we see a multi-layer model of ozone interacting with clothing and skin. On the top right, we see a dy molecular dynamic simulation of ozone encountering bulk squalene. And on the bottom right, we see a CFD simulation of the spatial distribution of ozone and 6-MHO and 4-OPA when ozone enters a chamber contain, uh, in which a seated human being is present. Well, with that, I hand the baton back to Bill Nazaroff, who is going to give you more exciting overviews of achievements of the Sloan program. Bill? Thank you, Charlie. I, we're both guilty of the professor disease of saying more than we originally planned. Um, so in these last few slides and last few minutes, I just want to highlight a few big picture achievements. Um, and I can't avoid mentioning the importance of home chem led by Delphine Farmer and Marina Vance, uh, which was the largest field campaign conducted in indoor environments um, ever, uh, still is, I think, even after CASA. Um, as of uh, kind of now, there are 18 published articles and a large number of citations, and you can see the scale of collaboration, collaboration that was involved in this. Uh, another important achievement to mention is the National Academies study, which I am sure would not have happened, at least not on this timescale, without the Sloan CIE program. Uh, it concluded that chemicals found indoors are a significant risk factor that can modify or degrade the indoor environment. About half of the consensus study committee were CIE investigators. Uh, the linkage of research communities, uh, Paula has already been credited for her uh, accomplishments in this area, and I, I, I can't overstress the importance. The, <clears throat> this presentation has highlighted discoveries that have emerged over the past several years, significantly because the CIE program has drawn together the building science indoor environment community with the atmospheric chemistry and atmospheric science community. The crossover contributions have included the use of instruments that had been developed 
for outdoor studies and rarely, if ever, used indoors. These better instruments enable us to see more clearly, and seeing more clearly, of course, leads to better understanding. There's also emerging this interest in the two-way interactions, which have been, let's say, stimulated somewhat by the CIE program. The organic compounds emitted indoors are, we're beginning to appreciate, a substantial source of our organic legacy in outdoor air. Uh, but it's also interesting that a large fraction of outdoor ozone that's transported indoors reacts to produce products, as Charlie has described. There's an interesting question not yet answered. Do the reaction products generated by indoor ozone-initiated chemistry contribute meaningfully to then outdoor air pollution when those are ventilated away? Thank you, Paula. And thank you, Glenn, for your 80% and 20%. Sorry, Barb, didn't get you a picture. Uh, so, uh, to wrap up, the processes that govern the chemical composition of indoor air, dust, and surface films affect the mix of chemicals that we ingest, inhale, ingest, and dermally absorb in the spaces where we live, work, and play, three by three matrix. It should be a no-brainer. Why wouldn't we want to understand these processes? Thank you.